All right, let's get started. Good evening to everybody joining us from Ohio and other parts of the US. Ohio gozaimasu to all of you joining us from Japan. I'm Ann Golden, Executive Director of the Japan America Society of Greater Cincinnati. And we're very honored that so many of you have decided to spend part of your morning or part of your evening with us. We're here to hear from distinguished speakers, Hiroyuki Akita from Nikkei and Jacob Schlesinger from the Wall Street Journal as they discuss the impact on Japan of geostrategic challenges in Asia. Before we start, I'd like to thank our generous sponsors who've made the event possible. Our premier sponsor is the Sasakawa Peace Foundation based in Japan. Additional sponsors are the National Association of Japan America Societies in Washington, DC and Frost Brown Todd in Cincinnati. Promotional partners for the event include the World Affairs Council of Greater Cincinnati and Northern Kentucky and the Foreign Policy Leadership Council. Thank you very much to all of our sponsors and event partners. We're very grateful to you for su supporting this event. Also, a quick word about our schedule. Our moderator, Joe Daner, will explain more details, but our event is scheduled to run until just about seven o'clock in the, in the official event. And then we'll have time after that informally for questions. So please send your questions through the Q and A function, either in English and Japanese or Japanese. And our moderators will pick up your questions at around seven o'clock, we'll start answering those. So feel free to do that. Next, I'd like to introduce Peter Kelly, president of the National Association for Japan America Societies since 2009. Peter would like to make a few opening remarks. Peter. Thank you, Anne. And thank you to the Japan America Society of Greater Cincinnati for, for hosting this event, to you, uh, Joe Daner and Steve Rinsberg for, for putting this event together. I'm Peter Kelly from the National Association of Japan America Societies. Tonight's event is entitled the impact of Japan, on Japan of geostrategic challenges in Asia. It is part of the geostrategy series, which the National Association of Japan America Societies and our partner in Japan, the Sasakawa Peace Foundation have organized. The purpose of this series is to draw attention to the significant challenges, geostrategic challenges that both the United States and Japan face in Asia. There are nine of these events being hosted by different Japan America societies in the first three months of this year. And each of them has two speakers, one from Japan and one from the United States who discuss the geostrategic challenges. Part of our effort is many Americans and, and particularly in a place like Cincinnati know Japan very well and appreciate Japan as a source of investment in the local economy. And we wanna use this series to make sure that people are also aware of the challenges in Asia that are growing by the day that both Japan and the United States face. We're very grateful to the speakers who participate, one each. Tonight, you have two journalists, so it will be journalist on journalist for the first time in the Japan in the uh, Geo Strategy series. And we, we thank both uh, Jake Schlesinger and Hiroyuki Akita for, uh, for joining us. This is the fifth out of the nine series uh, events this year. The next event will be a little bit later this week in, uh, in New Orleans, which will hosted by the Japan Society of New Orleans. And that will feature Tomohiko Satake of the National Institute of Defense Studies in Japan and Richard Fontaine of the Center for New American Security in Washington, DC. So that one will be Think Tanker on Think Tanker. We, uh, we are very grateful. We, we hope you'll enjoy the, uh, the presentations tonight and learn from them. I'm certainly looking forward to it. Thanks again to the, uh, to the speakers, the Sasakawa Peace Foundation in Japan and to the Japan America Society of Greater Cincinnati. Thank you, Peter. Next, I'd like to introduce tonight's moderator, Joe Daner. Joe Daner is an attorney at Frost Brown Todd here in Cincinnati and is the Japan America Society of Greater Cincinnati Board of Trustees past president. He has chaired Frost Brown Todd's International Services Group for over 30 years. The firm serves more than 100 Japanese owned companies with operations from Texas to Washington DC through its 15 offices. 
Joe counsels a wide variety of international and domestic companies on global matters. He's been to 80 countries as a lecturer, NGO volunteer, and podcaster. In addition to his service on the Japan America Society of Greater Cincinnati Board, Joe founded the nonprofit Foreign Policy Leadership Council. Please welcome Joe Daner. Well, thank you, Anne and Peter, and thank you for helping to organize this. We're in for a real treat tonight, so thanks for being with us. You know, 50 years ago, I was a lot younger, and there was a Soviet Union, and there was no European Union. Uh, the United States felt it was a superpower with no real rival other than the Soviet Union, but Japan was on the rise, and by the 1980s, it was the second largest economy in the world with maybe uh, no end to its future in sight, uh, eternal growth. History intervened, of course. Uh, and today, China certainly is uh, second, uh, maybe some people say even the first already uh, economic power in the world, certainly uh, far beyond what it was uh, uh, many years ago. And uh, there is, Russia is not the Soviet Union. And the European Union, let's face it, isn't all that united, is it? So it's all a lot of things we all need to understand better. Uh, what's going on today? What is the world really like? And so we're very honored to have with us two experts whose job it is in, the, in their life, aside from this event, to understand Japan and geopolitics, Asia, the United States, and how we should look at it. I'll be your moderator, and we're going to hear from our two guests, uh, and then we're going to have a three-way conversation until about seven o'clock. And then around seven, as Ann mentioned, uh, your questions, just put them in the Q&A. Uh, we'll have about a half hour until 7.30 uh, U.S. time in the evening uh, to uh, answer your questions. So please uh, post them throughout the event. Uh, and for the next hour, I think you're in for a submersion in Japan and the geopolitics of Asia and what it means for the United States. Now, first, we'll hear from uh, Hiroyuki uh, Akisha. Uh, Akita-san is a commentator for uh, Japan's great uh, Nikkei, uh, where he writes about foreign and international security affairs, uh, Japanese security policies, and domestic politics. He was Beijing correspondent from 1994 to 98. Uh, he reported major news events, such as the death of Deng Xiaoping, who had changed China so much, uh, and Hong Kong's handover to China. Let's uh, wonder what that's like today and how that affects what we're going to talk about. He was Washington chief correspondent uh, for Nikkei from 2002 to 2006, and that meant he covered the White House and the Pentagon and the State Department during the, uh, the second uh, Bush administration. Kitty-san is a graduate of uh, G.U. Gakuen uh, College and Boston University. From 2006 to 7, he was associate of the U.S.-Japan program at Harvard, uh, where he conducted research on U.S.-China and Japan relations. He won the Vaughn Ueda International Journalist Award for Outstanding Reporting of International Affairs. And he is the author of two books in Japanese, Onryu, the power game of US, China, and Japan, and Ranryu, strategic competition of US, Japan, and China. Akita san, the floor is yours. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me here today. And good evening for those in the US, and good morning for people in Japan. I remember that uh, I remember my wonderful trip to Cincinnati two years ago to speak at the annual conference of Najas. And I stayed in Cincinnati for several days and went to baseball stadium almost every night to cheer uh, Cincinnati Reds. Uh, what a nice uh, trip and I miss it very much. And I really look forward to coming back in near future. So in my 10 minutes first remark, I'd like to uh, explain and predict the future direction of Japan in terms of its strategy. Specifically speaking, I'd like to make a three point. Uh, first is the impact of this uh, pandemic uh, 
on the future geopolitical scenario in Asia. And second is uh, more specifically uh, geopolitical changes that Japan is facing. And then thirdly and lastly, uh, Japanese alternative uh, strategic options in that context. So first is the uh, impact of this pandemic on the future scenario of Asia. I, in theoret theoretically speaking, I think there are four scenarios. First scenario is that pandemic will slow down the rise of China and, um, will, and it will make it more difficult for China to play the leading role in Asia in, in the future. Second scenario is opposite. Uh, it will accelerate uh, the decline of US leadership in Asia. And third scenario is that uh, in between uh, is that pandemic will damage equally uh, US and China's leadership and Asia will be divided into the US and China's sphere of influence. So divided Asia. And fourth one is an extreme case, uh, but uh, there will be no leader as a consequence of this pandemic. Not, and no, and US not the leader and China is, nor China is, and Asia will go into a G0 world order. I think that uh, any scenario except first scenario, slow down the rise of China are bad scenario for Japan. But I'm afraid uh, to say that, but uh, it is likely in short term and medium term, it is likely a uh, third scenario is most likely divided Asia. And in long run, I think that a uh, fast scenario slow down of rise of China is most likely. So this is a first point I'd like to make. And based on that, uh, let's go to a second point. Specifically speaking, what kind of a strategic uh, changes Japan is facing now. Uh, all those changes, are, unfortunately, are negative changes for Japan. But there are three major factors. First factor is, of course, bigger and more assertive China. And second factor is North Korea and Russia. And third factor is the United States itself. So China. Uh, China is expanding militarily very rapidly. Uh, to the extent uh, that uh, military balance of power in Asia has been shifting to be more favorable to China. And the uh, number of the warship of Chinese Navy uh, surpassed that of US for the first time by 2020. And now China deploys about 2000 ballistic missiles on their ground and that covers Japan and Japan and US do not have none of them. But more importantly, uh, in, this, in the midst of this pandemic, China spreads the narrative that China's political system, Communist Party regime political system is much superior than that of the United States or other Western countries. So they try to expand their political influence too and they are emphasizing that COVID-19 situation proved that, is proving it. Of course, a uh, democratic country like Japan do not buy that kind of narrative, that, but we have to pay attention to this trend. Second is uh, North Korea and Russia. And uh, North Korea now, according to a latest estimate, now at, possesses at least 30 nuclear bombs and they keep producing additional bombs, nuclear bomb, every day. And according to a Japanese policy planner, uh, North Korea had already deployed nuclear ballistic missile that can hit Japan. This is a sea change for Japanese geopolitical situation. Uh, maybe please imagine that, uh, let's say Cuba deploys nuclear ballistic missiles that can hit all part of the United States. So this is the situation of Japan now. And Russia is becoming also more and more assertive militarily, maybe because, maybe partly due to the intensified US-Russian uh, confrontation. 
Uh, for example, Russia's a number of incursions by Russian military aircraft to a Japanese air defense zone is increasing very rapidly. So this is a second factor. Third factor, uh, I'm afraid to say this, but the third factor is United States itself. I myself and the majority of Japanese people uh, firmly believe that US-Japan security alliance is the backbone of Japanese security as of today. Uh, but uh, Mr. Trump treated US alliances with Japan or Europe as a cost, not as an asset. Now, Mr. Biden says that, no, 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 Mr. Trump was wrong and the US will keep making much of US alliances. So we wonder which, which is true. Of course, we hope that Mr. Biden is true, but uh, uh, also we have to, I have to assume that Mr. Trump's position reflects some part of US American uh, potential mindset. So this, all these three changes combined together, uh, I have to say that the Japanese geopolitical environment is becoming more unfavorable and will keep uh, getting worse. So that leads us to a, a third point. What will be the Japanese strategic uh, alternative strategy in coming years? If US-Japan Security Alliance will remain sufficient to keep securing Japan, that is plan A, and we don't have to think about alternative. But uh, maybe it is time for Japan to start inter intellectual thinking about the future scenario. So in case uh, that uh, US-Japan Security Alliance will not be a sufficient and Japan will need additional approach to secure Japan, there will be uh, three alternative options for Japan. First option, plan A, is to establish uh, security, um, establish regional multilateral security framework led by US and to supplement uh, US existing US bilateral security alliance with Japan and Australia and South Korea. Actually, uh, former Prime Minister Abe and Prime Minister Suga have been investing a lot of political assets on this option. For example, uh, Japan, uh, last, last October, Japan hosted a Quad meeting by inviting then uh, Secretary Mr. Pompeo and foreign minister from India and Australia and agreed to institutionalize a quad, for, quad foreign ministerial uh, dialogue. And also Japan reached out to Vietnam, uh, Prime Minister Suga reached out to Vietnam and Indonesia to enhance maritime security cooperation. But uh, if US will uh, reduce its security commitment to Asia, maybe plan B will not function well enough to keep securing Japan. So then we will have, uh, then another option could be plan B. That is very difficult, but th that will be uh, for Japan to drastically uh, enhance independent defense capability. Uh, this is very difficult, and very tough. Uh, China's military budget is four times bigger than that of Japan already. And Japanese dem demographic situation is, Japanese population is shrinking. And more importantly, Japan doesn't have a nuclear deterrent capability. Uh, while China, Russia, North Korea, all of them have nuclear missiles. So if plan B is hopeless, then last and least desirable option could be plan C. That is for Japan to accommodate China's sphere of influence. Japan, in Japanese history, Japan has never done it. And it is very painful. And it is nobody hoped that. Uh, but the logically, uh, plan C would be to accommodate China. So conclusion is that uh, Japan need, really needs to work together with the US more, more, even more closely to sustain plan A and plan A, uh, plan A possible. I will finish here. Thank you.
Well, thank you. And that's a perfect segue to our next guest, because now we'll turn to the United States view of, of things. And we couldn't have better uh, host for this journey than uh, Jacob Schlesinger. Uh, Jake is senior correspondent for the uh, Wall Street Journal's uh, Washington Bureau. He has previously covered trade and globalization. He served as the Journal's global regulation, uh, financial regulation editor. He's been deputy Washington Bureau chief. Uh, he spent the last 25 years moving back and forth between Washington, D.C. and Tokyo and other places for the Journal, where he most recently was Tokyo Bureau Chief uh, and Japan Editor. Uh, graduate of Harvard University with a degree in economics, he has covered topics including the Federal Reserve, uh, economic policy, and presidential politics. He's the author of Shadow Shoguns, the Rise and Fall of Japan's Post-War Political Machine, published by Simon & Schuster. He was a member of the journal team that won the 2003 Pulitzer Prize for explanatory reporting and was awarded Stanford University's 2014 Shorenstein Journalism Award for outstanding reporting on Asia. Jake, what are your views? <laughs> Well, thank you, uh, Joe, and also to Anne and, and Peter. Um, it's a great honor to be able to join the Japan America Society of Greater Cincinnati and the Sasakawa Peace Foundation and to, to be here with various friends, um, at least virtually old and new. Uh, my only regret is that I can't actually be there in person um, right now. I hear Cincinnati is, is lovely this time of year. Um, Akita-san gave a great overview on how things look from Tokyo, and, and he's a tough act to follow. I'm going to try and match him by giving a parallel perspective um, from Washington. And I'm going to start by noting that a month ago, Joe Biden paid his first visit as president to the State Department, and he declared, quote, the message I want the world to hear today, America is back. Diplomacy is back at the center of our foreign policy, end quote. That concept that American diplomacy is back is the bumper sticker for the Biden administration worldview, uh, which is intended to draw a clear and sharp contrast with his predecessor and signal a new era of US engagement abroad, uh, or in some ways, as Akita-san was saying, in the hopes of folks in Japan and elsewhere, a return to an earlier age of US engagement abroad. I'd like to use that as the frame for my uh, portion of the, the remarks today to explain what Biden means and doesn't what's likely to change and won't, and what that signifies for Asia and for American allies, in particular, of course, Japan. Um, but before going forward, let's briefly review the past four years of American foreign policy under President Trump. Uh, Akita-san went into this briefly, but to go into a little more detail, Donald Trump took office in January 2017, vowing to smash the longstanding bipartisan consensus that had defined America's role in the world. Since World War II, American presidents, both Republican and Democrat, had committed to building a world order defined by American leadership and American values of free markets and democracy. They created and cultivated a complex web of alliances and international institutions, and they believed that that was all in America's enlightened self-interest, even if it, if it involved some clear costs, whether that was stationing US troops abroad and going into battle to defend that order far from American shores, or keeping US markets open to free trade and investment, even if that hurts some American companies, communities, and workers. Japan, by the way, was one of the biggest beneficiaries of that Pax Americana, which is a point that Akita-san made well, um, that US troops in Japan and around Asia ensured Japan's security through the Cold War and have continued to do so in the post-Cold War Asia, increasingly defined by a rising China and a belligerent, unpredictable North Korea. Open U.S. markets helped make possible Japan's export-driven economic miracle and the rise of Japan's world-beating automotive and electronics industries. As I say, American leaders for decades broadly felt that that was an acceptable bargain. Yes, there were periodic tensions over trade and burden sharing for defense, but overall, Japan was seen as vital to the U.S. as a partner and a model. There was, on the other hand, a separate view, a minority view that was part of the American debate, that American leaders were naive, they were suckers, selling out to American interests in the name of vague globalist ideals, while our so-called allies, including Japan, took advantage of us. Donald Trump held that view long before he became president. In fact, it was one of the first public political stances he articulated 
when as a young New York real estate developer, he took out full page newspaper ads in 1987. And this is the period, Joe, you had referenced in your opening remarks about Japan feeling ascendant. And in those ads, Trump called on the US to curb military support of Japan and other allies. The ads read in part, quote, for decades, Japan and other nations have been taking advantage of the United States. The world is laughing at American politicians as we protect ships we don't own, carrying oil we don't need, destined for allies who won't help, end quote. And while Trump's positions on many other issues fluctuated over the years, he remained consistent on those concerns and took them into the White House. His bumper sticker was America first. He demanded allies from NATO to South Korea and Japan pay significantly more to maintain their military ties with the US under the threat of scaling back or withdrawing American troops. He pulled the US out of the Paris Climate Agreement, the Iran nuclear deal, the World Health Organization, while effectively paralyzing the World Trade Organization. He de-emphasized the goal of advancing human rights and democracy as a pillar of American diplomacy. And I know uh, an issue of great interest to a lot of people in this, uh, in this event. He pulled the US out of the 12 nation Trans-Pacific Partnership Trade Pact, which had included Japan and was a top priority for Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. Trump also dusted off long dormant trade laws to slap steel and aluminum tariffs on allies around the world, including Europe and Japan, and launched a trade war with Beijing imposing tariffs on more than $300 billion in Chinese imports or two thirds of all the goods the US buys from China in a year. Biden has moved quickly to reverse many of those Trump actions and to change the tone of American interactions with foreign leaders and global institutions. He rejoined the Paris Climate Agreement and the WHO and cleared the way for the WTO to choose a new leader, a process that Trump had blocked. Biden has signaled an openness to renegotiating the Iran deal and is preparing for a summit of democracies to demonstrate a clear bond with like-minded nations. He halted Trump's attempt to scale back troops in Germany and has apparently dropped Trump demands for big new payments from Japan and South Korea to cover the cost of American bases in their countries. And yet, as Akita san raised the question so well, the change from Trump to Biden may not be as great in America and for America as the rhetoric suggests. And I say that for three reasons. First, Trump may no longer be president, but he and his ideas remain a major force in the Republican party and in American politics. You could see that at the enthusiastic reception he got just this past Sunday in his speech to the Conservative Political Action Conference in Orlando, his first public appearance since leaving office. And there he declared that, quote, in just one short month, we have gone from America first to America last, end quote. And he touted the durability of what he called Trumpism. It's obviously too soon to know whether Trump himself runs again for president, and if so, whether he can really win. But it's clear there's a large block of Republican voters and office holders who are incredibly loyal both to the man and his America First platform, which means that viewpoint, once considered fringe, is now a major and newly prominent part of the American political debate. That gets to my second reason for saying that the change may be less than meets the eye. That is, as much as Biden may want to restore the pre-Trump world order and America's place in it, allies are likely to be more wary about the stability of American policy. What Biden says is that American diplomacy is back. What allies hear and see is an America going through an intense divisive domestic argument over just what the role of the country should be in the world, one that may seesaw back and forth for years to come. And that has implications for how other countries react to the United States. The cover headline in the latest issue of Foreign Affairs Magazine is Decline and Fall, Can America Ever Lead Again? In one essay, Jessica Matthews, a fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations, explains the implications of the new global image of the United States. Biden, she, runs, she writes, will confront cautious, even skeptical foreign partners, a challenge to which American leaders are unaccustomed. Foreign governments understand that last year's presidential election was not a repudiation of Trumpism, even close allies have therefore been forced into a dangerous game of American roulette, dealing with the United States that can flip unpredictably from one foreign policy posture to the opposite. The logical response for them is to hedge, avoiding major commitments and keeping their options open, even when it comes to US policies that would otherwise be welcome. In such an environment, everything that Washington hopes to achieve will be more difficult, end quote. And my third and final reason for suggesting some doubt about a full return to the pre-Trump world order is that for all Biden's talk of undoing the Trump legacy, 
he actually agrees with some important changes that Trump engineered. For all the talk of polarization and division in American politics, there is an emerging consensus around core elements of Trump's approach to globalism and globalization. This is true in particular about China and trade. I don't believe that if Hillary Clinton or Joe Biden had won the 2016 election, that they would have pursued the same policies on China and trade that Trump did. But Trump in the past four years has helped shift American views on China to the point where leaders of both parties now see it more as a competitor and rival driven by entrenched values and priorities different from and antithetical to ours. Few American policymakers still hold the common view of the late 20th century of Beijing as a partner that can through incentives and integration be reformed along the lines of the American model. Note that while Biden has quickly moved with executive orders to block or reverse many Trump actions, he has not touched Trump's measures to reign in China. To the contrary, he has, over the strong objections of the American business community, decided to move forward with the Trump proposed rule banning any technology related business transaction with China that the Commerce Department deems a national security threat. Nor has Biden done anything, at least so far, to lift any of Trump's tariffs or restore an emphasis on expanding free trade and opening markets. Biden is continuing and perhaps expanding on Trump's Buy American policies for government procurement and a focus on building domestic supply chains in key technologies, changes that risk restricting American business for Japanese firms, among others. In response to Biden's call for cooperation in forming a coalition to contain China, one thing American allies, Japan in particular, say the US could do would be to join an Asian free trade bloc built around American market-oriented rules. Indeed, that's what the Trans-Pacific Partnership negotiated by President Obama and advocated by Prime Minister Abe was intended to do. Trump pulled the US out of that pact early in his presidency and Biden, for all his talk of working with allies on China, is steering clear away from rejoining TPP, wary about the toxic domestic politics of trade. Of course, as Biden hesitates, Japan and others won't wait. And that gets to the growing hedging strategy that Akita-san mentioned that Japan and other countries are mulling. That's illustrated in the European Union, which agreed in December to complete a new investment treaty with China over the objections of Biden aides, who had asked Europe to hold off and coordinate with Washington first. About the same time, 15 Asian countries signed off on the new Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, or RCEP, a kind of TPP rival trade bloc that includes China and Japan, but not the US. But that's now a risk American leaders seem willing to take. For the establishment in both parties, Trump's election and his durability have been a real wake-up call, but a wide gap had emerged between America's global agenda and support for it by America's working class. Even if those leaders believe that global agenda was and remains the right course to pursue, and that the overall benefits to the country exceeded the costs, they've concluded that it became politically untenable. And so in a way, you can look at Biden's agenda as an attempt to revive a pre-Trump American foreign policy, but to try and make it more sustainable by marrying it with Trumpian arguments and policies, at least in the short term. And I'll end with that and look forward to uh, the exchange of views that Joe will lead us through. Well, what a great start. And uh, Jake, I'm gonna start with you on this one and then we'll turn to Akita son. But you know, it's said by some knowledgeable commentators that Japan depends too much on China for its prosperity and too much on the United States for its security. You think that's true? Yes. <laughs> no, I mean, it, I mean, it, it's, uh, it, you know, Japan's uh, dependence on China for trade as much, um, you know, is, is highly significant um, as Asia becomes a regional integrated economy um, you know, Japan can't really function uh, without being fully open to China. I think a lot of the talk of trying to decouple from China is particularly uncomfortable for Japan. But as Akita-san said, well, I mean, Japan can't exist with a security arrangement without U.S. backing. Um, and I think that as the U.S., even under Biden, tries to force uh, a greater decoupling from core parts of China, um, I think those that's going to be a really hard position for Japan to be in. Yeah, Nikita Sun, I'll turn to you, but let me just add a couple of statistics for the audience. Uh, China is 24% of uh, Japan's imports and 19% of its exports. Uh, compare US, uh, 18% uh, 
of our imports are from China and only 7% of our exports go to China. So very different relationship, isn't it? So what do you think? Is it true? Uh, too much reliance on China for prosperity, too much on the US for security? Uh, I agree that uh, your description, and according to a recent uh, survey for Japanese companies in China, uh, they ask, uh, the question was that, uh, do you have any plan to relocate or reduce their operation in China? And only, it was only, I think, six or 7% of the company who said yes. So more than 90% of the Japanese corporation wants to stay in China. But actually, I may, as I remember that uh, US Chamber of Commerce in China or Shanghai <coughs> conducted a similar survey for American companies who have operation in China. And uh, I think it was about 10% of the company uh, that are willing to relocate or reduce its operation in China. So uh, there is a difference of degree of reliance on China between US and Japanese companies, but the non Japanese, not only Japanese company, but the American company also wants to stay in China to penetrate, to keep penetrating into, into Chinese market. So that is a similarity, uh, though there is a difference of reliance on Chinese market between US and China, US and Japan. And as for, uh, Japanese too much reliance on US security umbrella. Uh, it is uh, partly due to the history, uh, but uh, also legacy of uh, US Soviet Cold War context. So maybe it is time to adjust, not the change, but adjust for Japan to bear more uh, burden for Japanese defense itself. Defense itself. Let me ask you both uh, about something else, and I'll start with you, Akita san this time. Uh, in 1991, things changed. Uh, the yen was uh, very, very strong, enormous growth that was going to surpass the United States, 1991 hits. And China, Japan might have done some of the things we've been seeing in the United States, mightn't it, but it didn't. It, it said, we're going to be a global leader. We're going to continue to believe in globalization. We're not going to put sanctions on uh, Chinese imports. In fact, foreign direct investment by Japan went up into China, despite uh, what's called the stagnation uh, of Japan uh, that occurred. United States, as Jake has rightly summarized, in, in Ohio, we have two senators, one Democrat, one Republican. Uh, the Republican used to be our USTR, but he no longer supports free trade. He's a fair trader. And Sherrod Brown always has been a longtime uh, uh, supporter, really, of what, uh, Jake, you've called Trumpian ideas on trade. Not much else, but on trade, yes. But Akita Sun, um, why did Japan, and it continues to be now ever more a global leader about fair trade when the United States seems to be taking a very different approach. Why, why is that? Mm, now, Japan, uh, as we observe from Tokyo, uh, the rise of China is good and bad for <clears throat> Japanese future. Uh, of course, positive aspect is that there, there is a uh, plus some element of Chinese rise and Japan get, uh, can uh, enjoy the dividend of China's bigger China economically. But uh, as we observe in Tokyo, uh, China now start try, tries to change the rule of trade and also rule of digital sphere, of digital sphere and also try to change the international rule on the maritime issue and so on. So basically uh, Japan wants to play the role to sustain US strong commitment to this region, economically and militarily. And that framework, one of that framework was TPP. TPP is not the trade liberalization, but the TPP is a rule, rule making framework by US and its allies and partnership. So uh, unless Japan plays more proactive role not necessarily global role, global leadership, but the active role to sustain U.S. commitment to this region. This region will be 
designed by Chinese rule. And that is the one Japan really wants to avoid. That's why Japan is now willing to play a little bit more international role in this regard. Jake, your thoughts on this? And, uh, you know, is there a possibility of a political movement uh, in favor of globalization in the United States? So first, to get back to your, your uh, observation earlier um, about the Ohio senators, you know, it's interesting. Sherrod Brown, as you say, uh, I mean, interesting as a Democrat, not only supported Trump's trade policies, but he uh, was very good friends with Bob Lighthizer, who was uh, Trump's trade representative uh, sort of successor a couple times removed from your other Senator Rob Portman. And apparently one of the things that that uh, Brown and, and Lighthizer bonded over is they both had roots uh, or at least family ties to Ashtabula, Ohio. Right. Um, and uh, I, I gather they used to, among other things, uh, share a singing of the Dylan song, which which uh, invokes Ashtabula in one of its lyrics. So um, in any event, I, look, I think, um, you know, there's another reason, and I don't say this to be the only reason why Japan is, is, has, and a lot of Asia has embraced free trade and globalization when the U.S. has had a backlash, which is if you just look at trade surplus and trade deficit numbers, um, most of Asia has big trade surpluses and has continued to run those, um, and the U.S. has persistently run big trade deficits. And to be clear, I'm not saying, you know, a trade deficit is, is a problem. In fact, the U.S. was quite prosperous for many years when we ran trade deficits, but just as part of why um, trade becomes politically unpopular. In some ways, it's it's harder to defend when you have a trade deficit in manufacturing industries losing jobs than when you have a trade surplus. Um, to your question, you know, will we see a globalization movement again? I mean, I think it's possible in the same way that we did, um, you know, after the 1930s and through World War II and beyond, where I think it became very clear to Americans that they thought it was in our interest to build that world order, um, despite all the criticism, you know, I, I, there were, people felt it was in our interest to rebuild Europe and Japan after World War II. Um, and again, selfishly, it was partly because we wanted markets overseas. And for a period of time, you know, we ran huge trade surpluses selling goods to Japan and, and, and Europe. Um, so, I, you know, I think if you can rebuild, I think two things, if you can rebuild support for understanding why the U.S. should be a global leader, that would help. And secondly, and this is a lot of what Biden talks about in his aides, you have to rebuild the consensus, the belief that trade is in the benefit of the vast majority of Americans. You know, economists talk about net benefits and, and, and have all their equations. And I, I'm sure it's true that on balance, free trade has been great for America as a whole. But there's been huge numbers of Americans and huge communities where the pain has been concentrated. And until we come up with a policy that figures out how to dissipate that pain or to, to cushion it, um, you're not gonna see that. And I think that's part of what the Biden strategy is, whether they can pull it off or not. Well, we'll find out. Let's just talk briefly about Russia for a minute. Russia, after all, is an Asian power, at least uh, views itself that way. And Akita Sun, you've mentioned their buildup of uh, the naval part of uh, the Eastern part of Russia, the coast there. But what about Russia? Is, if it's throughout a wild thought, is it maybe uh, Japan, uh, has an equal interest with Russia and the United States in countering what we see from China, not just the South China Sea, but throughout the region. Uh, can one see uh, uh, a rather strange alliance one might not have predicted around that? Uh, yeah, you, <clears throat> I, I, either one of you at this time. Who wants Go to ahead, I can send you start. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Prime, former Prime Minister Abe was a good friend of, with President Putin. And, uh, and he couldn't get a peace treaty. Right, you right, still need a right. Peace yeah, treaty exactly. Japan. One of his I wrote, yeah. I wrote the very critical commentary of, of about his Russian policy, oh. <laughs> uh, because of the reason, uh, because of the reason you just just mentioned. But the rationale for former Prime Minister Abe or Japan uh, to maintain to have maintained good relation with Putin is to drive, is to drive wedge, wedges between China and Russia. Mm. Uh, I, but it was a failure. But the purpose was to drive wedges, or well, at least try not to push Russia toward uh, Chinese side so much. Uh, so it's kind of a geopolitical tactics for Japan. And uh, Japan hoped that the Japan will get a four islands return for, for Northern Territory Islands now occupied by Russia get returned 
as a consequence, consequence of this series of negotiation between Abe and Putin. But I don't think that Abe uh, counted on that possibility. Rather, he tries to uh, maintain relatively <clears throat> better geopolitical environment by bringing, by attempting to bring Russia to Japanese side. But uh, after all, China is too big for Russia to ignore. Uh, Russia's G uh, China's GDP is five times bigger than, the, than that of China, uh, Russia. And the population is 10 times bigger. So after all, there was a limitation that Japan can, could do. So I think that the Japan-Russia relation will now f uh, enter to a new phase and from spring to autumn without passing summer. No summer. <laughs> no, no summer. That would be a disappointment. Jake, any thoughts on this one? You know, actually, actually I was in Moscow uh, the summer before the pandemic hit, and it was only 50 days. <laughs> so I'm not even sure being there in summer is helpful. Look, I think one uh, other change that makes it harder for Japan to, to bond with Russia is the change in the United States. Um, mm -hmm. I remember I was actually at a dinner at the Japanese ambassador's residence the week before the 2016 election, and everybody at the table was assuming that um, that Hillary Clinton was going to win. Uh, and a lot of the discussion was about how at the time Abe was planning a summit, uh, his so-called onsen summit with Putin uh, <laughs> early December. Um, and I think there was all this talk of whether that would raise tensions with President-elect Clinton, especially since Russia had, you know, clearly at that point already it was known was trying to subvert her election. You know, as we all know, that didn't happen. Um, and the Trump administration, while at, you know, lower and mid levels, was pretty hard on Russia sometimes. Um, the president himself would never confront Putin on anything. Um, and I think that in some ways gave Abe and Japan more of a free reign um, to explore diplomacy uh, with, with, with Moscow. Um, not only is, is Biden clearly gonna take a harder line specifically on Russia, um, which makes it hard again for Japan to try and juggle those two things. Um, but it's interesting how Biden is trying to frame um, the confrontation or the cop or the the challenges of China and Russia in a broader point about sort of democracies versus autocracies. Um, you know, he's he's calling, as I mentioned, this summit of democracies coming up, and I think, you know, as Akita-san was saying, you know, Russia. I mean, China is trying to sell itself as a model that has better managed the pandemic. And I think broadly, you know, Putin too and Russia too is saying that 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 the pandemic has shown that American democracy is is a is a failure. Um, and so I think the more that Biden frames this as not just bilateral, but as a kind of global challenge of two different blocks, I think Japan obviously is gonna have to choose and presumably would choose the US block. Um, and that, that just makes it an even more complicated effort. Well, let's talk a bit about uh, Prime Minister Abe's uh, legacy and what will remain of it and what will change. And I'll turn to you first, Jake, but a couple of observations. He certainly had great uh, successes, didn't he, in the global stage. He, Japan, clearly a global leader about free trade matters. U.S. dropped TPP, but Japan went right ahead, and now we have, they have a, a two, two different trade packs, a great success from the Japanese perspective. Um, some failures. Uh, the, he couldn't revise the Constitution. Uh, hasn't happened. Uh, the Japanese uh, abductees in North Korea have not been returned. Uh, we mentioned uh, no peace treaty with Russia. So some disappointments, let's call it. But uh, I, I think the one I'd like to ask you both about, but feel free to mention uh, how long term the Abe legacy is going to be. Japan's longest uh, serving prime minister, very successful, stable politics, and yet elections are coming. And we'll see what the new prime minister, uh, how, he, how he fares. But the Indo-Pacific strategy, this idea that that's really what Japan is focused on, not to ignore the rest of the world, but involving India and uh, Eastern Africa, and so and that that's really a region that uh, it, it needs to be in play. It's not just China, that, that whole concept. I think he was successful in pushing it, but what do you think, Jake? And then we'll get your views. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I think you're right. I mean, I think he deserves credit for, um, for promoting that idea. And in fact, you know, the US kind of took the phrase Indo-Pacific uh, from Abe. Um, from Abe. Trump made that sort of his, his, his sticker as well. I mean, I think also, I mean, both Akita-san and I did in our remarks um, talk about um, 
you know, the difficulties and unpredictability of, of alliances under Trump. But I think one thing out of fairness that is worth noting is that US-Japan relations under Trump actually were quite strong, um, despite a lot of the complexities. And I think Abe gets huge credit for that as well. Um, you know, Abe- uh, First really, to play golf with the- yeah, for, And gave him a very expensive <laughs> golf driver. Um, <laughs> You know, Abe, I think, understood before any other world leader and more intensely than any other world leader, the importance of personality and personal friendships with Trump. Um, you know, sometimes, uh, to be honest, it was a little cringeworthy, the, the sort of sycophancy that, that he went to to sort of try and placate Trump, including saying he was going to nom nominate him for a Nobel Peace Prize. Um, but I think partly, again, the, one of the points that Akita was making is Japan is hugely dependent on the U.S. And I actually think you know, we don't know how far Trump might have gone had Abe not appeased him in a way and angered him in the way that so many other world leaders did. Um, and so I think just the preservation of the U.S.-Japan alliance is another thing that Abe uh, gets a lot of credit for. Anyway, I'll turn it over to Akita-san. Yeah, and we still have a large trade deficit with Japan. It just right. isn't talked about as much given what we have with China. But uh, Akita-san, your thoughts on this Indo-Pacific and, and Abe's yeah. legacy? Uh, former Prime Minister Abe played not only played golf with uh, Mr. Trump for four times, but uh, he somehow, I assume, uh, managed to lose by slim margin to please Mr. Trump without <laughs> noticing, without recognizing him that uh, Abe did on purpose. But it is a state secret, so I don't know the result of the <laughs> golf. We won't but, tell. <laughs> yeah. What goes but, in Cincinnati stays in Cincinnati. Right, 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 right. right. But in short, uh, I echo Jake's observation. Uh, I basically, essentially, what the Abe achieved is to uh, establish framework for Japan and US to sustain, especially for Japan to sustain strong US Japan security alliance in coming years. For example, in the Pacific strategy is basically is to pursue plan A, as I mentioned. That is a multilateral security regional framework led by US to supplement US-Japan Security Alliance. And also Abe uh, kept increasing defense budget very incrementally, but the defense budget. And also the uh, more, most importantly, he de facto he virtually he revised constitution without revising constitution itself, but in revising the interpretation of constitution um, and passed the security law that enabled Japan to uh, implement collective defense right for the first time. So he his legacy is all those policy tools, but question is that uh, Prime Minister Suga or his successor, whether they will be able to utilize those toolkits well enough to achieve its goal, plan A. So I, I'm not so sure about that. And also, uh, I just want to make, uh, uh, explain my observation about the future of US and, US and Japan Security Alliance. So there is a two way to look at US actually US approach to Asia in that context. One is that now US is facing a transition, transition. The US needs to time to revitalize its domestic economy and also mobilize its public, public support for the global leadership. So it is transition, you will, US will come back again. Japan basically put a lot of money on this scenario. But the China uh, says, no, no, no. It is a big change in once in 100 years. That is a decline of US. So decline of US, US will not come back. US will just keep declining. So China is maybe betting a lot of money on that. So, so depending, depending on whether US is facing a transition or this is the start of a decline, Japanese, or other US allies approach to US will differ a lot. If it is were to be a decline, other US allies, not only Japan, have to prepare for the plan B. But if it is a transition, which Japan believe it is, uh, maybe uh, Japan is willing to uh, contribute for US to go through that process as 
fast as possible. So in that sense, Japan support uh, Biden's foreign policy that benefit uh, middle class of US. So, but I don't know the answer whether it is transition or decline. Well, we'll find out. Let's meet again in 10 years. We'll know the answer. <laughs> I will begin to, but let me, let me, uh, one last subject, and those of you in the audience will turn to your questions in about five minutes. So put your Q&A into the uh, question and answer box, the chat box, if you wish, and uh, that's where we'll start in about five minutes. But here's my last topic, two minutes from each of you, please. Uh, South China Sea, but it's really, a, a, it, it's kind of a, just a phrase we use to ask this question. Can, can Japan really trust the United States to do what it's been doing for 70 plus years, and vice versa. Can we expect Japan now to not just expand its Navy more than ever, but perhaps one day even become a nuclear power? After all, their missiles facing them, as you <laughs> pointed out, from the DPRK. I've been there. Uh, yeah, strange place. But, um, you know, this question, how much trust is there today in a fundamental sense about this partnership uh, the two countries have had for so long now? Uh, Akita san, two minutes. What do you think? Okay. Uh, since again, since Japan uh, now, as of today, believe that US is facing painful transition or painful start the painful recovery of US global leadership. So in that sense, Japan trust Japan believe that US will keep security commitment to Asia, including South China Sea. Maybe it may weaken for incoming years, but it will come back. That is a premise. That is a belief as of today. Um, about the nuclear option, uh, now Japan is, US provides strong nuclear umbrella to Japan. So Japan doesn't have to worry, uh, think about nuclear option. But if we have to move to a plan B, uh, then nuclear option uh, is the one we have to maybe uh, think. And there are spectrum. One easiest option for is to Japan to accommodate nuclear weapons of US, like West Germany or European, West European country during, world, uh, during Cold War period. Mm -hmm. Then second one is the nuclear sharing, like the UK and what the UK and US is doing. And third option could be a French model independent nuclear capability within the framework of US-Japan alliance. And fourth one is a independent nuclear, like India and Pakistan. That is the one I really do not support. This will break down the US-Japan alliance. So maybe, you know, there's a spectrum and we, in the future, maybe US-Japan could think about easy, easiest, you know, start, easiest option that will be to, you know, accommodate US nuclear asset. Well, Thank you, Jake, this. your thoughts on this. Yeah, so, I, I mean, I think to answer your question directly, you know, at a surface top line level, I think there is trust still on both sides. Some of that trust is just rooted in hope, meaning <laughs> I think for both countries, if the trust in the alliance declines, um, you know, therein lies a lot of unpleasant things that neither one wants to get into. I, I would just say, um, maybe a little bit of a diversion, but I think a couple points worth raising that we haven't gotten into yet in that context is there are sources of potential tension between the U.S. and Japan that might arise under Biden that would not have existed under Trump. So one is Biden more than Trump is emphasizing democracy and human rights. And mm -hmm. uh, you're seeing not necessarily um, open, but I think behind the scenes, a lot of tension uh, beginning to emerge between Washington and Tokyo over how to handle Myanmar, where both countries have condemned the coup. The U.S. has sanctioned the leaders. Japan, I believe, has not yet taken financial action and hasn't said whether it would. Um, Japan has much bigger economic stake in Myanmar than the U.S. does, and you know that's a potential crack. Another has to do with uh, Japan's relations with South Korea, which are terrible and continuing to get worse. Um, and that's been a source of tension between the US and Japan for a while, not to say that the US only blames Japan, there's enough blame to go around there, but the fact that America's two biggest military allies in Asia cannot talk to each other is a serious problem for America projecting force in the region uh, and really building an anti-China alliance. And I'll just close by, by noting that Biden himself has some personal history in this. 
which may carry over, which is that in, uh, in December of 2013, Biden was in Asia um, visiting Japan and then South Korea to try and, when he was vice president, to try and broker, essentially, if you will, a, a peace uh, agreement between then Prime Minister Abe and then South Korean President Park Geun-hye. Uh, and one of the things he supposedly thought he got from Abe was a pledge not to visit uh, Yaskuni Shrine, uh, which everyone knew would inflame South Korea. Biden supposedly told Pak, President Pak, that that wouldn't happen. Two or three weeks later, Abe goes to Yaskuni and things just really uh, collapsed for a while. And, and Biden apparently was personally furious at Abe in Japan for that. Um, he obviously um, sort of moved on. Uh, but I think that that's another issue that has to kind of be there when you're talking about trust between the countries. Perfect. Well, it's seven o'clock time for Q&A. So our team has questions. If you've submitted them in Japanese or English, it's fine. Uh, first question, please. Question from Lynn Hamamoto. How do you think the multiple threats of climate change, <clears throat> excuse me, to national security of either and both allied countries stacks up against perceived military threats in view of the fact that military activities of buildup are inherently toxic to the global environment? Jake, why don't you go first? Yeah, actually, I'm glad that you asked that question, Lynn, because climate change obviously is another, you know, hugely important issue for both countries and for their relationship. Um, you know, I don't know that, um, I, I don't know how you compare and contrast it with a military threat. And I think increasingly, if it becomes worse, as some projections suggest, you know, climate change becomes a military issue, whether it's climate refugees or uh, mm -hmm. battles over scarce resources. Um, I, one interesting wrinkle to me is um, that for all of Biden's talk of, of continuing Trump's policies of confronting China, um, he also really needs cooperation with China on climate change if you're going to really make a dent um, in carbon emissions, China being the world's largest uh, carbon emitter uh, of greenhouse gases. And so, and, and that's also, I think, a delicate issue that they haven't really addressed in the Biden administration. And China understands that. They understand that the U.S. badly wants their cooperation, and I think sees that as a bargaining chip, uh, perhaps over other issues like trade and human rights. Akita-san? Yeah, uh, I think Japan uh, now perceive, uh, perceives uh, climate change is not only threat to a threat not only to the environment of Japan, but Japanese national security. Uh, Japan, in recent years, Japan is being hit by many, many hurricanes and also many heavy rains and so on. And according to a, a commander of, former commander of self-defense forces of Japan, uh, maybe more than 10% or some time, some year, about 20% of operation was deprived to uh, the oper deprived the, for the operation of humanitarian disaster relief. So it is taking uh, it is uh, you know mm -hmm. uh, so climate change is causing a lot of disaster in Japan only mm -hmm. also in Japan and that is causing a lot of trouble for Japanese security policy too. So mm -hmm. in that sense, uh, it is uh, understandable that the Suga administration committed zero emission until 20, 2050. Mm -hmm. So this is a security policy, not only environmental policy. Thank you. Next question. Uh, Nicholas Yoda asks, can you talk about the Biden administration's view plan and plan towards nuclear, nuclear developments in North Korea as compared to the Trump administration's? And how do you think these different or similar approaches will directly affect Japan? Do you want to start with Jake? Because it's kind of a U.S. Sure. question that we'll go over. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, I mean, Trump um, had an interesting and unconventional approach to North Korea. I mean, in some ways, that was one of his more interesting diplomatic forays. Um, you know, he started by promising fire and fury and insulting uh, Kim Jong-un, calling him little rocket man, uh, and ended up... Um, you know, overruling a lot of his advisors and sort of decades of conventional wisdom to reach out directly to Kim Jong-un and write what he himself called beautiful love letters um, to each other. Um, you know, I think some people think that that may have helped lower the temperature a bit um, and perhaps, uh, you know, paved the way to some progress. I think most people would say that there wasn't any evidence that the progress happened. And as Akita-san said in his opening remarks, um, 
you know, North Korea has continued pretty aggressively with its nuclear program. You know, the Biden administration is not going to continue with that diplomatic overture that that Trump did. Um, it's still a little unclear what their strategy is going to be, whether they try and go back to a so-called six party talks approach um, uh, that had existed earlier, uh, which included Japan and the other major powers in the region. Um, uh, as for how that affects Japan, I'm going to let Akita san pick up the baton there. Yeah, as for <clears throat> uh, as for Mr. Biden's approach to North Korea, I uh, totally agree with uh, Jake's observation. And if I add, uh, maybe you know, from Tokyo perspective, uh, the possibility for us to be able to denuclearize North Korea is getting less and less in the context of U.S.-China strategic competition. If I were China, uh, there are two options. Let's say. There are two options about North Korea. North Korea without nuclear weapon, that will be able to normalize its diplomatic tie with the US. This is scenario one. This means that North Korea will be a friendly, country, friendly partner of the US, and the US will have a US embassy in Pyongyang uh, guarded by Marine Corps. So this is a denuclearization de de scenario for China. And second one is, Nuclear weapon will remain in North Korea and US North Korean relation will get worsen and worsen. But North Korea will have nuclear and then stabilize its keep stabilizing its political you know, system. And also they can resist to uh, pressure from US and China will support North Korea. So North Korea will remain as a useful buffer for China, which is better for China. Definitely second scenario. So I think that if I were to be a China's leader, I will of course say, let's denuclearize North Korea, but under the surface, keep providing economic assistance so that they will be able to stay as a useful buffer with a nuclear weapon. So uh, it is, uh, I think that is my uh, analysis about the prospect, yeah. Sorry, if I could just weigh in for one more. Sure. I mean, I think that's also, where the Japan South Korea relationship is crucial because ultimately I think one of the worries that the US has is that South Korea will increasingly be drawn into the China sphere. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that the more that there's tension between Japan and, and South Korea, um, the greater the odds are of that. And so I, I, I do think, you know, as the Biden administration worries both about North Korea and China, the pressures on both Japan and South Korea to patch things up are going to become only greater. Fascinating. When you visit the yeah. only golf course in North Korea, there's a whole <laughs> list of members, and they're mainly Japanese names. Quite interesting. <laughs> so there's still things going on that uh, one doesn't read about. Next question, please. This is from Sing Hoon Kim. I believe it's directed at Akita san. You mentioned that Japan has not accommodated to China. Could you elaborate the third option or provide possible options for accommodation for Japan? Okay, so yeah, yeah, so basically she wants to elaborate uh, the plan C, as I described, accommodation of China's sphere of influence. <clears throat> uh, I should uh, emphasize again that this is the least, least desirable option, but uh, uh, if I elaborate, this is, the, you know, this will be the reality. Japan will make concession on territory. This means Japan will, uh, uh, maybe engage joint development of a Senkaku Island by accepting China's kind of a position that there is a dispute over the Senkaku. So one is a concession on t Senkaku. And also maybe Japan will uh, be forced to uh, accept a more favorable trade condition. And also uh, Japan will accept a digital rule that will be set by China. And then this means Japan will be maybe, uh, Japan will be a part of uh, China's digital and economic sphere of influence. And also maybe Japan will uh, maybe uh, accept China's interpretation, maybe not accept, but that Japan will be uh, uh, pressured to accept China's interpretation of history. And China may ask Japan to you know, revise this part of a history book and so on. So this will not be an equal partner of Japan and China. 
but uh, it is a partnership between you, uh, Beijing and Tokyo that is uh, that condition, which condition is set by China. That is the scenario of Plan C. Not favored. Uh, of and course, it is. <laughs> Yeah, Jake, any thoughts on this one? No, I mean, I guess just a couple of things I'd say. One is, I mean, I think another condition would presumably be loosening ties with the United States. Oh, yeah, 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 sure, sure, yeah. sure. And, you know, it's interesting, I, you know, Akita-san says, you know, this isn't in Japan's interest, and I believe most Japanese think that. And I know this was a long time ago, but I remember when I moved back to Japan uh, after a hiatus in, in uh, 2010, um, you know, uh, Prime Minister Hatoyama had just taken office, and and, and he had really freaked out people in Washington with an op-ed he wrote in the New York Times and comments he made sort of suggesting that Japan needed to kind of look more at a, a triangular relationship of equality between uh, the U.S. and China. And, you know, while that was repudiated quickly and and I, I do think, again, I'll defer to Akita that there's a strain out there of sort of this Asianist view maybe small in Japanese thinking, which is, you know, we are an Asian nation and our future really lies with Asia and Asian powers, not with the West. Mm -hmm. Next question, right. please. In accommodating China, is it possible for us to incentivize and or socialize China as a responsible stakeholder in maintaining and advancing common values and regional order of the Indo-Pacific? Jake, we'll start with you this time. So, <laughs> The question is, is it possible? Um, I have no idea whether it's possible or not. I would say that belief that it was possible informed American policy toward China pretty uh, definitively from the early 1990s, you know, at least through 2012 and arguably through 2016 with diminishing returns. Um, meaning I think a lot of Americans felt like that was what was inevitable. That was that if you put China into the World Trade Organization, if you but, you know, had China open its market and trade with the rest of the world. It, I mean, Bill Clinton explicitly said that when he was selling China's entry into the WTO. Um, I think most observers of China, including those who said that at the time, at least in the United States, have changed their views. They do not think, either they don't think it's possible or they just think it's folly to, to, to place a bet on that. And I think that's part of the reason why you've had such a sharp turn, uh, not just by Trump, although he started it, uh, but really across the board in the United States. I think most people do not believe it is possible anymore. Does Japan <clears throat> believe it's possible? Uh, uh, actually, the question is not, uh, maybe question may not be whether it is possible or not, yeah. but the question is whether China is willing to be a responsible stakeholder by our definition? Mm -hmm. And the answer is no. I'm not blaming China, but mm -hmm. China is big enough. And uh, China now hopes to be a superpower suppressing that of U uh, suppressing US by 2050. And it is a kind of official goal uh, of the Communist Party. And until 2035, they say, they, they set a goal to Establish strong one of the strongest military. So basically, uh, they are not interested in becoming a responsible stakeholder by definition of U.S. or Western country, but that they want to be a responsible leader by their definition. That is that doesn't include the notion of a Western demo model of democracy. So. <clears throat> It is, uh, I'm sorry, but I'm afraid that I have to be very pessimistic. I, just to briefly, if I might add to that, I think Akita-san put it well, and I would say <clears throat> a Chinese government leader, if asked that question, would flip it back on the question and say, is the US or Japan, are they willing to be stakeholders that you know are willing to follow Chinese beliefs and accept China's rise? Um, <clears throat> and I think they would say, we don't, we don't believe that's necessarily possible. Next question, please. Okay, this is by Toshinori Otsuka. What are some of the key indicators that we should watch out for to judge whether the U.S. is in transition or in decline? <laughs> Let's start with you, Akita-san. How do you how do you judge that? It's a good what are you looking for from us, Akita-san? <laughs> oh yeah, okay. I I. <laughs> what do you want? First of all, my profession is journalist, so I will ask 
uh, American counterpart or <laughs> expert, whether it is a transition or not. But uh, to be serious, I myself pay attention to the trend of public poll. Uh -huh. For example, Chicago Foreign Council's public poll, and also Pew Research and Gallup's. And all public polls shows that, give impression to me that it is a transition because uh, the American public still uh, show strong support for American military or security commitment abroad. And the uh, majority of the American people are supportive of US uh, to maintain US strong alliances, alliances with, uh, uh, for, uh, supportive of US alliances. So one is a poll, but the second is the income gap trend. Now 1% uh, of wealthy people in the US holds more than 50% of a stock of US. It is kind of, a, it is unsustainable. So I would like to pay attention to a trend of this gap between rich and poor. This has to be, has to get fixed. If this gets wider and wider, I think that if I were to be American taxpayer, I do not support US federal government to pay money to sustain military commitment abroad. So this is a two major indicator I'd like to pay attention to. Very interesting. Uh, Jake? So I, I guess maybe citing two, starting with an anecdote to cite two contradictory trends. Um, I remember talking to a friend shortly after um, January 6th, that sort of awful day here in Washington and elsewhere. And he had said he was watching um, CNBC. And uh, as the TV was showing footage of, you know, extremist protesters storming the Capitol to try and disrupt, you know, this fundamental act of democracy, the Chiron was showing all of the stock market indexes hitting records that day and saying Dow hits record, S&P hits record, NASDAQ hits record. And um, you know, to the extent that you think the stock market uh, has some reality or, or, you know, which is a projection of your views on the future, um, you know, it was kind of a bet that for all the problems that the U.S. <laughs> was showing on great display, um, a lot of people think, as Akitasan says, it's a transition and, and that there is an optimism out there. And some of that has been borne out um, by economic indicators since that have shown, you know, things may not be as bad as people had thought and are recovering faster. But on the other hand, um, and I don't know how you put a measure on this or you gauge it um, for all the public opinion polls and things that Akita Sun is citing. I, mean, I do think we are in a crisis of our own democracy right now. Um, I think it is a serious problem, you know, whichever side you were on, whether you believe that there was a uh, serious election fraud or not, um, the fact that you have a large portion of the population and a large majority of one of our two political parties that fundamentally believes we did not have a free and fair election. Um, I think if you can't stabilize a fundamental belief in American democracy and everything that flows from that, I think we are in decline, uh, both in terms of our ability to project our values and leadership around the world uh, and our ability just to fix our own problems. Um, and I think we don't know how that, that particular question plays out right now. Good point. Next question, please. How can the Quad be strengthened as a kind of Asian NATO? What kind of steps would be required and how can the ROK, the Republic of Korea be brought on board? And as part of that, you may want to explain what the Quad is briefly for some of the audience. Uh, okay, yeah, you I guess I want to, you're, you're the security <laughs> expert here. Why don't you start with that? There we go, a okay, data sign. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah, Quad is now, uh, uh, Quad means in Japan or in Asia. Uh, quad means now US, Japan, Indian, Australian uh, framework in which uh, all these three, four country discuss about a security issue and trade issue, kind of holistic uh, topics. And then try to, uh, the framework that tries to institutionalize its security or a trade or economic cooperation. So current status is that uh, four country uh, agreed to have foreign ministry meeting on a regular basis. And the Biden administration is now proposing uh, reportedly proposing uh, 
to hold a summit, quadrant meeting for the first time. And the question is uh, whether it will be, it will evolve to be uh, Asian NATO. Uh, I'm a bit skeptical about the NATO uh, because in NATO, in order to make it to evolve to be a NATO, Japan have to change its constitution. Uh, when India or Australia will be under attack by somebody, Japan have to send forces uh, under the NATO framework, but the Japanese constitution does not allow Japan to uh, play that role unless Japan is under the serious crisis uh, because you know, Japan uh, renounced the war. So, but still uh, it could be uh, very helpful and important security cooperation framework, not necessarily mutual defense treaty, but the security framework by which uh, four country will uh, cooperate uh, on us maritime patrolling and also a uh, capacity building assistance of those ASEAN countries that uh, wants to improve their coast guard capability and so on. And as for ROK, as I understand, ROK is a bit cautious to engage this quad because China perceive it as an anti-China framework. And ROK don't want to get sandwiched by China and US in that context. So Japan, uh, of course, uh, welcomes, I think, if ROK commit to engage, but uh, so far they are cautious. Jake? I, I don't have anything to add. I think that covered it pretty well. But quickly on uh, Biden's approach will be more multilateral than Trump's was? Yes, oh, definitely. I mean, I think, again, Biden, you know, his, I mean, I had talked earlier in my remarks about, um, you know, Trump's whole view was a, from early on was a skepticism of alliances. I mean, Biden, mm -hmm. in contrast, I mean, literally grew up both, you know, learning the alliance system, supporting it, building it, um, you know, 40 some years in the Senate, chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, a guy who, you know, spent his whole career meeting foreign leaders. I, I mean, he really believes in alliances for alliances sake and in the power of alliances and in the projection of American force by, you know, linking countries together. All that said, again, you know, it's it's a nice principle whether you can get Japan and Korea to agree in another complexity, you know, beyond just Korea being sensitive about, um, uh, you know, getting caught between the US and China is, would, is Korea willing to accept Japanese troops playing a bigger role, Japanese military patrolling more actively around the region and possibly visiting, you know, the Korean homeland? Probably not. Um, and so in that sense, the, the, the notion of true coordination is probably pretty far off. Next question. Next questions by James Skaya. We heard a lot about the PRC, the People's Republic of China, but what about Taiwan's status and how will Japan respond with US or without US support to PRC's possible belligerence towards reunification? And secondly, PRC's belligerence towards Hong Kong. Maybe, Ed and Jake, you go first here. Would the U.S. actually defend Taiwan if it were attacked? But anyway, here's yeah, I mean, it's a good. I mean, it says it will. I mean, it, it, the U.S. has made very clear that it considers Taiwan, um, you know, to be in its national interest. Uh, uh, you know, um, Secretary of State Blinken has has in some ways said he, you know, un unequivocally that he would support uh, and continue the Trump administration overtures to Taiwan. Um, if anything, I think. Uh, the Biden people will take a much harder line than the Trump people did on, on Hong Kong. Um, so at least rhetorically, um, you know, the U.S. is 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 committed to uh, those actions. Now, you know, push comes to shove, what happens militarily? Hard to know. I mean, I think the U.S. hope is that by making that commitment, um, China will back off. Um, but I think, you know, the problems and the complexities there is that as, as you know, Taiwan feels more fiercely independent, as Taiwan fears more becoming, you know, seeing what's happened to Hong Kong, um, you know, does Taiwan try and make a more explicit break and does that upend this uneasy uh, sort of, you know, status quo? I mean, in a way, a more, ver you know, extreme version of what happened with the Senkakus, which is there was this kind of uneasy status quo, 
until Japan, the Japanese government bought the islands and then and took over them. And then it, it, it sort of created a new uh, instability um, that I don't know. I mean, how Japan would respond, I'll leave that to Akita-san. But before you go on, Jake, would, yeah. would the U.S. expect Japan to participate with the U.S. if Taiwan were attacked? You know, I think what the U.S. would hope, and this was part of the um, change in the security laws that, that Akita-san mentioned earlier under Prime Minister Abe, is that Japan would at least feel free to play a more active supporting role, uh, if not necessarily in combat, and probably not, because that would be a bridge too far, uh, but at least, you know, logistically could play a much bigger role in supporting American troops from behind uh, and helping create a more effective regional response. Okay, Sam. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to make a two points. One is that uh, about Taiwan possible entry to TPP. Uh, Taiwan shows, uh, officially, Taiwan shows the interest to enter TPP. Mm -hmm. So uh, Japan will have to face the kind of question whether uh, Japan will support Taiwan entry to TPP before China or not. And uh, of course, uh, Taiwan have better, Taiwan's economic uh, framework system is better matched to a TPP than mainland China. So maybe Japan have to uh, make a political decision at some point. And also Japan uh, openly support the, uh, for Taiwan to be an observer of WHO. So Japan is incrementally, Japan is trying to be more supportive to Taiwan. And Japan doesn't want to go too far. Japan doesn't want to go beyond the US. But if go, US is more proactively support Taiwan, there is more room for Japan to go forward. And second is the Taiwan contingency. As I talk with the military experts in Tokyo, and this is a likely, uh, maybe this could be a possible scenario. If there's gonna be a war between US and China over the Taiwan uh, crisis, Taiwan contingency, maybe it is likely that whether Japan will like whether Japan will like or not, Japan will be get dragged into the war because U.S. will use the U.S. military base in Japan, Okinawa, maybe, to conduct military <laughs> operation. So, in order to stop it, maybe China will need to attack U.S. base in Japan. It is otherwise it is difficult for them to stop U.S. operation. So of course they will try to sink aircraft carriers coming to rescue Taiwan. Uh, so if China launched attack on Japanese soil, US, US base in Japan, this is the war already <laughs> between, not only between US and China, but automatically it is a war between Japan and China. So this is very, uh, it is very unfortunate, but uh, it is kind of a reality, I think. So there will be no option for Japan to just, just sit and watch. Hard to if be neutral. Be, yeah. yeah. I mean, I guess, so, if I could just wait briefly, I mean, I think maybe a, another um, sort of more subtle way of looking at it is, I think from the US standpoint, the best way of preventing any of that from happening is having a credible deterrent and increasingly, right cooperation with Japan and a more active Japanese role, the potential for it becomes part of that credible deterrent. Yeah, well, I think there's going to be a more serious uh, consideration about what the Jake said between Washington and Tokyo. We might have time for one last question and maybe 15 second answers. So <laughs> one last question from the audience. Emily, why don't you go ahead with yours? All right, so for the final question, could the Tokyo Olympics serve as a, a desirable venue to improve relations between countries such as between the US and Japan with China, ROK, Russia, and DPRK? Good to end on an optimistic note. Uh, Akita-san. <laughs> okay, 15 seconds. I think uh, Prime Minister Suga is very, very determined to host Olympic, as of today. And uh, my prediction is that Japan will host Olympic uh, but maybe virtually it could be like a sports international international sports festival, because you know it is very difficult to invite all country. But uh, Japan will anyway will call it Japan and IOC will call it Tokyo Olympic. Uh, 
that is my prediction. Very good, Jake. Last so word. I'll try and hopefully saying I hope so. And I think that <laughs> in some ways the more interesting question well will be a will there will be an Olympics and then b whether that spirit of harmony can continue to Chinese Olympics in 2022 or whether uh, the tensions spill into increasing calls for boycotting that. Perfect. Let's hope for no boycott and the world peace will break out and all will be well. I can't thank you both enough. Uh, thank you, Akita Son, and thank you, Jake, for leading this. We thank the Sasakawa Peace Foundation, NAGIS, uh, everybody who helped on this. The recording will be available uh, both on the Japan American Society of Greater Cincinnati YouTube channel and the Sasakawa Peace Foundation's website in about two days. Thanks to everybody. It's time to wrap up and you've given us a lot to think about. We thank you greatly. Thank you for all the great questions and the great mind. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you. Good evening to you all. Best wish. Let's enjoy beers. <laughs>